Terrific. Well, thank you so much for having us on your show. Um, uh, addition, uh, I now run Draper Associates, which is some, another one that I founded. So uh, just to make it clear. So I was the founder of DFJ. I am now the founder of Draper Associates. And through the Draper Venture Network, I'm a part of Draper Gorin Home. And uh, it's great to be on the show with Alan. Hey, yeah, excited to be here. Thanks, thanks uh, for having us, everyone. And really, uh, uh, yes, I'm I'm one of the founders of Draper Goren Home. Um, we invest in early stage blockchain startups, and uh, actually, um, <clears throat> Alex has joined us as well. Um, he's the senior editor at Coin Telegraph. Uh, thanks for having us, Alex, and the whole Unitize uh, team. Alex, can you hear me? Hear us? Oh, here from Alex. <laughs> I think he's got a delay, or he's not hearing us. Um, anyway, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, we think that this is a revolution uh, in new technology that's going to transform some of the biggest industries in the world, and uh, we just love crypto. We love what it does. We think. Um, the the blockchain is is going to transform the system uh, of that we have of uh, accounting and legal and uh, and smart contracts are going to take over the whole um, the whole legal world and this is going to be a an amazing transformation over the next ten years. Um, now I see that I've frozen on the screen. I can. Hear and see both of you guys. I don't know. Or I can see you. Uh, Alex, I can't hear oh, you. Did I freeze? Did You're I freeze? My salon? <laughs> You're, I can see you uh, perfectly. And I just went off on how great Bitcoin and blockchain are. <laughs> I, I, uh, I heard you. Uh, if you can hear me, good. I don't rock. Oh wait, I'm on. Alex, you're finally on. You're finally yeah. on. Speak. Yeah. Well, I'm in the <laughs> sorry, not the, the time so zone difference and like the, the fact that we're on different sides of the world. Uh, yeah, sorry, I kind of had to uh, jump off in order to reload. But yeah, I'm um, glad to be back, and I'm really excited to be part of you know, this conversation and uh, to have a chance to uh, pick your brains on uh, some of the biggest issues. Um, around investing in uh, you know, early stage um, startups and uh, blockchain uh, firms. Um, I mean, let, I don't know what you've been discussing, but let me just jump into like the first question that I've uh, prepared essentially for you uh, too, is um, why for you uh, sort of investing in blockchain is sort of the main the main interest and what are the uh, main concerns that you would have when you come across an exciting small project? So Alan, you want to start? Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, I think we, we all know Tim just was talking a little bit about, about Bitcoin um, before you came on, but I think Bitcoin sort of drove us all in here and we have a lot to say about it and we're very, very obviously all in on on Bitcoin and what it can do and transform uh, how it could transform the world. I think that sort of this this inspired so many incredible companies and products, whether it's it's in the DeFi space or even in gaming. We just saw that that epic commercial for a minute before we started that pumped me up. Um, but we we also have um, you know, this opportunity from the technology side, people building smart contract and infrastructure and things like that. And I think that when you look at, at the world, you know, these, some of these products don't feel like they're ready for mainstream adoption, but, but you can almost analogize, analogize it to like JavaScript and go like, well, JavaScript isn't ready for mainstream adoption. But, but my mom doesn't know that it's a JavaScript pop-up on Facebook that, that's taking in her information to share with her grandkids, right? So um, for me, the, those early stage companies are what's going to build the infrastructure for the future that will actually 
make it uh, uh, so that we can uh, really change the world with this technology. I think it'll be those small companies that, that really does it, that do it. And, and for me, uh, I think it, um, it came because uh, I got to see the internet and how it transformed the world. It opened up free markets around the world. The world became wealthier and the people of the world became healthier and happier and, um, and, and their bellies were full and they were um, much better, um, they were in much better living conditions. They started to travel. They were all connected through a smartphone, and and uh, so if if they didn't know how to do something, they could always go to the smartphone and figure out how to do something. It opened up the world. Well, I look at this as and and that opened up the world, and it transformed communications, information, gaming, entertainment, number of different great industries. But um, but when Bitcoin came along and and you tie you you thought about Bitcoin as a currency as a global currency, a blockchain as a vehicle to keep perfect records, and smart contracts as a way to uh, to rethink um, contracts and how contracts operate and how contracts can be can be set in stone, <laughs> literally. Um, and they uh, they can. Um, those can transform the biggest industries of the world. And those are, um, and you're seeing it already in banking. You're seeing that people are much happier banking with a, oh, I, I don't have one with me. You know, something like this, uh, where they they put all their money on a, on a uh, ledger or something, than they are banking with that guy who's dressed like this and he has, he, he works out of a big glass and steel building, and you wonder where that came from. That money came from for him to build that. Um, now you've got a, a proven, uh, trusted third party that is going to transform banking. Now I think there are going to be uh, a number of other industries. The the uh, insurance business is going to be transformed. I mean, I could do I could create a great insurance company with just uh, a uh, surveillance and a uh, smart contract with all my customers and maybe somebody who's who's an actuary who who knows how to kind of um, game the horses. Um, And then uh, and and so insurance is going to change. And what most of government is, is insurance. And so government is going to go through a major change, major overhaul, and we're going to see much better governance per dollar that we pay in taxes because governments are going to be able to take advantage of these new um, these new currencies, the new blockchain. So they don't need to have auditors and accountants and all that. They can build taxes right into the blockchain. They can create a smart contract with everyone who does business in their country. Um, this is a major breakthrough, major opportunity for, for government to change. And governments are going to compete across border. They're going to, there's this virtual layer and then there's this physical layer. And the virtual layer is becoming more and more a part of our economic system. And so I'm very excited about what it can do with government. That's going to change everything. And these geographic borders are going to be less and less relevant. And and it's all because of these technologies that have driven first the Internet and now Bitcoin and how they're driving this this decentralization, this openness. Um, and, And you're going to see changes in some of the industries in the world. And we're we're going to be big as consumers we're going to be big beneficiaries of this um and and you know i just read that uh that uh only one in 14 bitcoin wallets or wallets of any crypto are women so when women cross the chasm once they cross the chasm this is going to be prevalent everywhere um and women control 80% of the, the retail shopping. And so uh, when crypto becomes commonplace in retail, 
we're going to, and once they realize, once the women realize that they can save two and a half to four percent every time they swipe their credit card, um, or their they swipe their their debit uh, card, debit debit crypto card, um, <laughs> yeah, like that, or or just use their <laughs> smartphone. Uh, that's going to open up the entire world market, and we're going to see. Uh, the prevalence of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies spread throughout the world. Um, and you're going to start to wonder why anybody ever used fiat currency that was tied to some political force. And they can print nine trillion of them. And we're just supposed to sit there and go, oh, I guess our money just got diluted by 30 um, percent. It's, of course, been happening in Argentina and Nigeria for years. But this is one of the great breakthroughs where we have currency we can really trust. So I'm excited about this, clearly. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Tim, you actually touched up on a point that I also wanted to bring up about the globalization. And like from your experience, Tim and Alan, uh, do you look for companies that are based close to where you are or established in, for example, less developed economies. And additionally to that, are if they're run by women, for example, or some, I don't know, people of different ethnicities, is that an additional uh, motive for you to come in and engage with that company and bring them up as part of your uh, mentor studio? Um, what do yeah, you, I'm, uh, I am. I am totally a free market capitalist, um, and I'm open to whoever. And we have a global system of venture capitalists around the world, the Trade for Venture Network, uh, and uh, with offices in, uh, there are probably 46 offices around the globe now. And so we have the ability, and I'm also an LP in a lot of groups in other parts of the world, we have the ability to invest in anything. We have a company called uh, BitPesa, um, now called uh, that, uh, that uses crypto to trade Nigerian Naira for, for Ugandan shillings for whatever, um, all throughout Africa. And now it actually is penetrating Southeast Asia and they're, they're making it so that, um, people can do business even if their country has a currency that is run by, uh, you know, political whims where they, they print a bunch of the money and the money's worth less and less. If I had a Nigerian Naira six years ago, I would be, and I, and I put it away, I'd be pretty disappointed right now. I think that Nigerian Naira might have been worth, uh, what, what is it, might have been worth, I don't know, 30 to the dollar, and now it's 500 to the dollar. Um, and to the Bitcoin, it's much worse. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we're always looking for, for companies wherever they may be. Um, we've been very, we funded a lot of women, mostly because we look and we say any woman who's willing to break out and start their own business, they've got to have something special to them. Uh, and so we do probably give a little bit of a favoritism to women. Um, and, uh, and, but we're kind of um, race blind. Uh, we're always looking for whatever the great entrepreneur is going to be, wherever they may come from. And that could be from Southeast Asia. It could be from Japan. It could be from England. could be from Africa. It could be from any number of different places. Uh, and we just are looking for the opportunity and that, uh, that drives our business and it drives the world. I mean, God, think of what we backed Hotmail and Skype. Think of what they have done for the world. Uh, they've opened it up. We can, we can all now communicate. We can see each other on the screen. We can come from anywhere in the world and we do it basically for free. That was, I mean, before we funded Hotmail, it was very expensive to get a message to somebody in some other land. And before we funded Skype, uh, a long distance phone call to Uganda would have cost um, 
$80 a minute, something like that. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a major change in the world. And so we feel like, boy, if we just keep backing these extraordinary entrepreneurs, whoever they are, wherever they may come from, uh, we're going to improve the world. It's going to be better. And, uh, and so that's the way I look at it. And I say, you know, I don't, you know, come with whatever uh, history you, you have, uh, whatever background, whatever religion, whatever race, whatever sex, we're in. We're interested. Uh, you, just, you come to us with something that you've created, invented, driven. Uh, we're all over it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I was just going to further Tim's points. There's not much more to say that, than, uh, you know, one, one just quick aside. I remember growing up, I had family all over the world, and uh, my, my parents are immigrants, but I was born and raised here. I remember overhearing my parents discussing that the phone bill was more expensive than our mortgage. Um, and I remember one of the big wins for us that we got my grandma a standalone device that let her Skype us the last few years before she passed away. And back then, this was a crazy piece of technology. All of our cousins each put in like 100 or 200 bucks. Like for more, it was more expensive than a computer for her to have this thing device next to her uh, bed because she was bedridden to, to be able to talk to us. And that's, that's you know, how much this world can change so quickly. And, um, and like, like Tim said, a great entrepreneur is a great entrepreneur no matter where they are in the world. Um, and we're going to try and back them if, if we love them and their idea. Um, and uh, to further it even more, um, there's data that proves that, that investing globally in immigrants, in minorities, and in, you know, in, in women um, actually earn you higher returns. So, so we, you know, what, what Tim was saying about the favoritism a little bit, there's there's actual data that proves that they've had to overcome more obstacles to get to where they are, um, and it makes them you know more makes them better entrepreneurs. Um, just like a lot of times immigrants end up being better entrepreneurs, it's because they had to jump through these hoops to get here or to get to where they need to be that some of us didn't have to. So um, I, you know we want to support them, and of course you know selfishly it's it's a good investment as well. That yeah, actually, like a big the trade first, secret. Yeah, the first two um, ICOs that we backed um, were were two of. I mean, other than the Dow, they were the first two ICOs, um, and they were both driven by women. Um, and and so, you know, we were pretty excited about that. They. It seems that the idea of an ICO, the idea of these cryptocurrencies is is a big deal um, for women who who are focused on community and the quality of the community and how um, how they all work together for a common goal and that's where Tezos and Bank Bancor came from um, uh, Kathleen Brightman at uh, Tezos and uh, is really quite extraordinary and uh, and at Bancor it's uh, Oh, I just talked to her. <laughs> um, what? What's that? Uh, Galia, I think is her name. Galia, yeah, Galia at Bancor. They they were so extraordinary that I I just backed them right there, and that was the beginning of two of the greatest ICOs in history. Um, and they, you know, those were women driven. So we're we're excited. My my daughter um, started uh, Halogen Ventures, and she only backs uh, teams that have a woman in the uh, founding team, and that has uh, that has served her very well. And I think she was the first venture capitalist to just come out and do that. So I'm very proud of her. Talking about the future and being first, I mean, I also wanted to. Uh, ask you about the sort of development of investment into blockchain projects. So first we had the ICOs, then we moved on to venture capital capital and uh, private. And now some of the companies are starting doing the IPOs, even though they're still at relatively early stages of their lives. Um, what do you think, which direction do you think the 
so it's all going to go. A more company, blockchain company is going to start behaving like the traditional company or we're going to see a different pattern. Uh, Alan, Alan, can we start with you, I'll, I'll, I think Tim Tim could probably talk to the more um, traditional side. Well, and he's much more experienced with companies having gone public and 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 all of that. Um, but what what I will say, um, I think that you know we, we I, I actually end up talking a lot to groups who are who are digitizing securities as well. And I think there's there's like two sides, right? I keep I always have this dichotomy because I'm much more passionate probably about the DeFi side that completely goes around all regulation and it's just like let's do what's right regardless of which jurisdiction and which government and whatever. Um, but then there's also this side of hey, we live in the United States, we have to obviously make sure that we're compliant and we deal with everything. And there's companies who are digitizing securities to make the process better for the consumer and better for the startup because it's it's offensive how much it costs for the startup and that people aren't allowed to participate. It's not okay. So so I, I love that we are um, on both ends of the spectrum making it better for the consumer um, and, and making it better for the startups. Um, I think that depending on the risk tolerance of the startup, where they're based in the world and all that, they're prepping themselves and stage, of course, prepping themselves for different things, whether it's like the DAO model or the ICO model or, you know, doing a digital security or, you know, a company that's much bigger, like, a, like Tim would be more familiar with, like a Robin Hood that going public or something like that. I think Tim could add yeah, a lot more to that. I don't recommend going public to anybody right now, unless your company's worth 10 billion or yeah, maybe Robin Hood. $20 billion because it's so expensive. They, uh, the regulators have made it so expensive to go public that it's really not worth it. So some form of tokenization, some, some system. Um, I do know that, you know, we've done a few things at meet the drapers with crowdfunding that has been, um, very effective, uh, for smaller investments. Uh, but, and, and at the, at the the largest investments are coming from those large funds, uh, and they that tends to be an easier way to get your money than trying to go public and be subject to the whims of the public uh, investor, and also to subject to the the rules that the uh, the Sarbanes Oxley rules that have come down so hard on uh, businesses. You know, we used to be able to get companies public if they were in worth 50 million or above, and maybe they were doing only 20 million in revenues. Now it's, I mean, it's not even worth it until you're about $5 billion market cap. So I'm not highly recommending that in any way as a, as a path for a, an entrepreneur. And, and by the time a company's public, it's, it's already past the growth stage. It's, it's become a common knowledge for everyone. And, um, and making money in the public markets is a little bit more of a crapshoot. You don't get, uh, it, it kind of runs way up the way it is now with the, the public getting all excited. And then it runs way down with the public getting all excited. And, um, and so for an investor, I think you really want to be, um, either you invest in private companies um, or you, I mean, or you buy tokens, but be careful about buying tokens. Um, I'm very excited about um, all of the new innovations that are happening because this new technology, or I guess it's sort of a platform of technologies, Bitcoin, the blockchain, smart contracts. I'm, I'm excited about what they're all doing and what they're, what they're gonna bring to the world. All these new ideas that have stemmed from the ability to do an airdrop or the ability to um, to have um, a perfect ledger or the ability to create a, a, a deal in in cyberspace that just um, that just pays pays the right person at the right time. I know Hollywood could use that. I mean, some very honest system. So you you ask a ask the question a little bit about ICO versus IPO, but the answer is 
there are lots of new ways of, of creating liquidity, uh, new ways of creating a business model. Uh, there, there are lots. This is an evolving market. And, uh, and it's exciting for me because I get to see venture capital change one more time. So this is going to be really fun. And I think we're, um, we're experiencing it now and, and uh, all the Draper entities, we're, we're driving that now. We're driving that change. Um, things I'm hoping to do long term, I'm hoping to be able to uh, raise money all in Bitcoin or crypto of any kind um, and then invest it all in Bitcoin and, and then have those entrepreneurs uh, put the money or, or uh, spend the money in on their employees and suppliers all in Bitcoin. And then I want, if something great happens, I want um, the smart contract to drop all the money into my uh, LP wallets, into all the wallets that, that are supposed to get it. Uh, now, right now, the U.S. government's very far behind on its thinking for that kind of a business, uh, but it's frictionless and it doesn't, you don't have to keep going back and forth to the banks, the accountants, the auditors, the transfer agents, the uh, whoever is out there. You can actually have all of it done completely frictionlessly um, on the on the cloud. So I'm thinking this is one of the great great changes that could happen in the world today, uh, where we're all one part of one system uh, that isn't tied to political systems. Uh, and that the the various governments compete for us, and they um, and they figure out how that they how they can charge taxes on that um, on that that crypto business. And those are those are some of the things that I think have to happen moving forward. And and we've we've got to have all that happen, but we've got to wrap all the laws around it. But What's really interesting is, you know, the U.S. is is trying not to be heavy handed, but they they kind of are because of all the all the legal work that's been done since 1933 and all that has been piled on and the regulators have piled on. So you in London have this new group that's saying, well, look, we want the financial world back here. They've had it in New York for a long time. They've got it in the Silicon Valley. We want it back here. So they're deregulating. They're actually creating fewer regulations and they're allowing more to happen. Um, and that's going to change uh, the way governments start to operate. They're going to say, wait, we're losing all of that economic value. How did they get it? Well, they deregulated. We can deregulate. So that's what I'm thinking is going to happen over the next, it's probably the next 10 years. And uh, just a very quick, short question right at the end. I uh, just want to ask you, if, for example, I'm a startup and I brought you a brilliant idea, what advice would you give me to take my company to that next level? Um, just a brief answer. Great. Alan? Alan? Can we start? Sure. So, so one thing I, I, I didn't mention on the last question is that with the tokens via stocks or convertible notes or whatever a company decides to do at the early stage, we're very, very in it for the long term from Draper Gorham Home and, and I think obvious, and, and on the Draper Associates side, we're early stage venture investors. So, you know, we, I, I love all of this stuff. But remember, when we invest in a company, it's not to get the tokens and sell them immediately or do anything like that. That's not our plan. That's not uh, what we do. So um, when I do come to companies at the very early stage, uh, to answer your question now, um, you know, for us, it's there's a little bit of, of, of it's, it's a, not I wouldn't say like, like magic or something like that, but it's just really is the people because we're so early, you know, when we engage with a company, we're writing their first check into the company. It could be a $25,000, $50,000 check. And we're the only investors in that company at the beginning, helping them get off the ground. So we want to see that the people can execute, that the people can do something. 
But more than that, we want to know that they can change and grow and, and shuck and jive as things come, because what they show us the first time we meet them will not be their product six months from now. And if they were to be that sort of thick headed to where they think that would be the case, then they're probably not the right entrepreneurs at that early stage. So, so for me, I, I want to see that. I want to see that they can move. I want to see that they're solving a real problem, of course, and they're super passionate about it. And that I like the people that, you know, we're, we're going to assume we're trapped in a room for the next 10 years. I want to like the person I'm trapped in the room with for the next 10 years. And then the next thing that we have this internal talk, um, Joseph, um, my partner, and I always have this one talk once we really love a company. We go like, what disproportionate value can we add to this company? Like, how do we throw gasoline on the fire? If it's a company we love, but we have no clue how to help them. It's not a good fit for what we do because we ha we're super hands-on. We kind of have to be hands-on at that early stage. And if we don't know what we're going to do, then, then we can't help them. And we have to have that conversation like, hey, I love you, but I don't know how to help you. Um, and so for us, it's a little bit of uh, how can we sort of, like I said, throw gasoline on the fire. We have our conference. We have a big media presence. We, we are, uh, you know, experts in automated marketing and and joseph is very very hands-on behind the scenes and in, in helping our companies really scale and and we do so many things like that that we need to know what the next steps are before we engage because we want to we, we treat we're early stage entrepreneurs ourselves and we want to be able to help the company so for me that that's where the the excitement comes from like is is there something here that can that can really really grow? Like to go back to what you said earlier, um, Tim Tim said talked about community and then how some of those entrepreneurs are really really passionate about the community. Something one of our our you know favorite portfolio companies always says, uh, it, you know Lunar Crush always says there's no crypto without community. And then they measure the engagement of the communities and they they help those those groups engage their communities and do things like that with the, with their technology. And I think that that those passionate entrepreneurs, if they get that at the beginning, if they know that they're building an exciting community or that people are starting to flock to them, uh, it's it's really, really super exciting. And we want to amplify it. Right. Uh, amplify is the big word we use. Um, so so that that's uh, I think I went around it a little bit, but <laughs> and amplifies and also the the incubator you worked with <laughs> way back. Yeah, right. so I that's so Tim was it Tim uh, was an investor in an a, an incubator called Amplify an Accelerator out here in Southern California, and about ten years ago or so ago, um, they invested in in a previous company of mine, and that's where I met Tim. So uh, we use the word amplify a lot out of love because when we sort of started, we we pointed at a lot of things that they did and how they did it right. And and uh, we're uh, and aside from that, also following what Boost VC does, um, Adam Draper, Tim's son. Um, I've gone to almost every one of their demo days at this point and uh, was a huge fan of what they did and how they did it. And they're partly responsible for some of my education. In the in the crypto space, I met Bitpesa, that company you mentioned earlier, at the demo day where they where they launched. You know, so like uh, um, you know, it's a uh, it's an exciting uh, full circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm, and I look for. Uh, uh, what, what were you saying, Alex? Got to wrap up. We are going to have to wrap up soon. So if you could, Tim, briefly just uh, give us like one, two sentence uh, view of what you think, and then that fortunately will have to be it. Good. Well, when we invest in um, these for these companies now, we, we want to make sure that we're aligned with the entrepreneur in whatever way they we can. Uh, so in, in doing that alignment, sometimes we take stock in crypto uh, so that because we're not sure which one's going to take off and we're not I don't even think the entrepreneur always knows whether their company or their token is going to be a big deal. Um, what we look for, we look for um, big ideas, big markets where uh, 
entrepreneur can kind of wedge in there and he's got a lot, he or she's got a lot of passion for what they do. Uh, and that's kind of where we're hoping to go. And I mentioned that the banker is dressed this way. Well, it turns out they are never dressed this way because uh, <laughs> I'm wearing a Bitcoin tie. <laughs> okay. I think they'd be fired. Um, anyway, it was great being on your show. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, it was a treat. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.